thanks for the question. Um, and yes, so you've highlighted a, a scientific brief that we published yesterday on uh, transmission of the COVID of COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. And in this scientific brief, it's not a guidance document, it's a brief um, which summarizes all available literature and evidence that we have about how the virus is transmitted, uh, when the virus transmits between people as it relates to their infection, and what this means in terms of breaking chains of transmission. Um, we look at droplet, we look at aerosol, we look at fomite, we look at fecal oral, we look at lots of different modes. And our attempt to do this is to consolidate everything that we know about this virus. It's not a systematic review, and there's new literature being published and being released every single day. So this is a living review. We call this a living review, which means it will be updated regularly. Within the brief, uh, we talk about droplet and we talk about aerosol. Your specific question is about aerosol transmission. And aerosol transmission is one of the modes of transmission that we have been concerned about since the beginning, um, particularly in healthcare settings where there are known to be these medical procedures called airborne generating, aerosol generating procedures, where we know that these droplets can be aerosolized, which means that the particles can stay uh, suspended in the air for longer periods of time. In those situations where the, the health worker is actually carrying out those procedures and for people working in those areas, we recommend airborne precautions, which is a certain type of per personal protective equipment for health workers. Outside of healthcare settings, um, there is the possibility that there could be aerosol, aerosolized particles in specific settings like indoor settings where there are crowded conditions, um, where there's poor ventilation, and where people are spending prolonged periods of time. And so what we've seen is that there are some outbreaks that have been reported in these closed indoor settings with poor ventilation, um, which include what you had mentioned, the nightclubs, which have uh, included choirs, uh, fitness centers, where airborne transmission could, cannot be ruled out. Uh, in those outbreaks, there could also be the droplet transmission and fomite, the contaminated surface transmissions. What we are calling for is more uh, systematic research to be done in these types of settings. So it's not just how and when uh, transmission happens, it's the settings in which they happen. So we need a much better understanding of these particular settings and these outbreaks that are happening so that we could better understand how transmission is happening. In terms of everyday life, um, every, everyday life, we recommend a comprehensive set of packages which include physical distancing, which does include hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette, which includes the use of fabric masks when you cannot do physical distancing um, and it, to, to ensure that when you have these closed settings that you have good ventilation. So it's a combination of packages. But um, the dominant route of, of transmission from all of the available evidence and our understanding and working with large groups of, of different um, uh, disciplines um, collectively is droplet in contact, although there may be other modes of transmission which we don't rule out. Um, so we have requested and we will be through our R&D blueprint, which we uh, began uh, working on since February, um, is to accelerate research in this area to make sure that we have well-conducted studies so that we could better determine the different roles of transmission, different modes of transmission, um, and so that all of the advice that we give is as up-to-date as possible.